that allows consumers to clear those products off the shelf. Aren't we creating a tremendous difference in the income stream that we used to assume would occur from production in this country that allowed the clearance of those products from the shelf? I mean, can you describe to me as an economist where we're heading with decisions? Well, one of the things you may be referring to is something that Lord Keynes talked about in the 1930s. Capitalism does have a tendency for supply to grow faster than demand, which means you have a role for governments, to, and by demand we mean both consumption and investment demands, for governments to make sure that demands are, are growing in parallel with supply. And certainly one of the things that's happened over the last decade on a worldwide basis, we've been, one of the reasons we all have problems, we've built up enormous excess capacity. You know, you take almost any product you think of, if you went around the world and said, suppose every factory making that product in the world operated capacity, how much could the world build? And then you make the most generous estimate possible, how much is the world going to buy of that product? You'll find 30% excess capacity for almost everything. And for some things like computers, the world could build two for every one it's going to buy. The problem is that Lord Keynes taught us how to solve that problem on a national basis. What we know is Keynesian economics, lower interest rates, cut taxes, raise uh, government spending when you have a shortage of aggregate demand, which now can't be applied on a national basis. You have to do it internationally, and you can't get the kind of global economic cooperation to do it. You know, if you, if you look at Japan, Germany, and the United States together, we're about 50 percent of the world GNP, which is what the United States used to be by itself. And so n nobody out there can be a locomotive for the world the way the United States used to be a locomotive for the world. So there, there is a structural problem there. Is it inevitable growth of the less developed countries will come at the expense of, of growth in the industrialized countries? Well, and, and is that an inevitable thing? That's not an inevitable thing because it depends on what the industrialized countries do. Uh, if we have a third world workforce, the answer is yes. Isn't and if that we, where we're heading And if we've moment? got two-thirds of Americans who are a third world workforce, the answer is yes for them. See, it used to be that if you were an American and relatively unskilled, you got an American premium because you'd work with more raw materials, better capital, better technology. Uh, and so even if your skill level wasn't above that found in the rest of the world, you get higher wages because of those first three things. But in a world where you can buy raw materials, you borrow capital in the same place as New York, London, and Tokyo, and you can do reverse engineering, then there's only one thing in the long run that's going to determine the wages of an individual American worker, and that's his or her skill level. And the fact of the matter is, it's very misleading to talk about whether America is or isn't competitive. Because the answer, as I tried to say, is about one-third of Americans are very competitive, and two-thirds of Americans have got this third-world skill level, and that's why we see falling real wages for them. It's something which economists, and you remember, may remember teaching, called factor price equalization. If you're not more skilled than a Korean, you'll work for Korean wages, no matter where you are in the world. And if you're not more skilled than a Mexican, you'll work for Mexican wages, even if you happen to live in the United States. And the problem is that creates social and political dynamite uh, if you have a third world economy sitting inside a first world economy. And I think that's it. that issue partly is skills, but it's partly having a strategy for getting the new high wage jobs like consumer electronics. Consumer electronics is the big American disaster. Second biggest industry in the world with no American presence. Well, much I mean, bigger than textiles. The people who are watching you on television are watching you on a device that we invented, but which we did not now produce. Right. In most cases, those people watching are watching on a set produced elsewhere, despite the fact that we invented it. And when we talk about, uh, you know, when we talk about the, the future and high tech and so on and so forth, I, you know, every, everything that we invent, it seems to me, someone else grabs and produces because the manufacturing jobs from those inventions can be done less costly elsewhere. And I, I think what you said earlier was that there's a kind of a homogenization with respect to this kind of a trade agreement with Mexico in which we will see inevitably generally lower wages. No, only yeah. for two-thirds of Americans. Well, but that's a pretty good yeah. hunk oh, of the I American understand. workforce. But see, re remember, our big trade deficit, we don't have a trade deficit with Mexico, and even when it was a deficit, it wasn't very big. Our big trade deficit are with places like Japan and Germany that have wages higher than we do, not lower. Uh, and, you know, Airbus Industries is the real problem, or it's an example of the real problem. Here is a European strategy to take America's biggest export industry away from it, and it's working. You know, they've got 25, 30 percent of the American market. That's a lot, millions of high wage jobs, a lot more important than anything that goes on in textiles between Mexico and the United States. And, and we sit here kind of having a tenter tantrum telling the Europeans they shouldn't do it, but the answer is if you're winning, you're going to continue to do it. And what I would say is where is the American strategy for taking consumer electronics away from the Japanese? Well, we have no strategy. That's yeah. been our, we have, we have proudly boasted now for the last decade in which we've generally lost, in my judgment, that we have no plan. Yeah. That ought not be a source of pride. See, see if you take now, shoes... Now, that's going to change, I hope. See, if you take shoes, it's an interesting problem. There basically are three shoe industries in the world. 
There is a low-wage, low-technology leather shoe industry, which is mostly in Brazil. There's a low-wage, medium-technology industry for making running shoes, athletic shoes, which is mostly in the Far East. And then, even by American terms, there's a very high-wage, high-fashion, expensive shoe industry in Italy that pays wages way above the average American wage, and they sell them in the United States. And so the question was, you know, why are American shoe manufacturers uh, just uh, folded up their tent and went away as opposed to competing in this part of the market that could in fact pay wages above American levels and uh, successfully do it as the Italians demonstrate every day. See, if you think of textiles and garments, the interesting thing is the world's biggest exporter is China, no great mystery. The second biggest exporter is Italy and the third biggest exporter is Germany. The United States is a net importer. And so if you take the whole industry, textiles plus garments, it is not competitive in world markets because we are a net importer. But it's interesting that you take Germany, which has wages way above that of the United States, which is a net exporter. They import a lot. They import men's underwear. You'd be silly to make that. But they're a net exporter to the world. And the question you have to ask the garment and textile industries, if the Germans can do it paying $25 an hour, why can't you do it paying 10 And I think that's a good question to ask to the garment and textile industries. Well, I, I always appreciate hearing you. And I regret I've, uh, my time is up. I've not uh, had a chance to ask Mr. Donahue or Mr. Leiser a question. I, I must observe that. In this debate, it seems to me, often we, we tend to talk past each other in slogans. And, uh, Mr. Donahue, your testimony would be characterized and dismissed by some as just pure protectionism. Uh, protection has become a sort of a, a, a bad word in this town, at least among some of the institutional thinkers. And, Mr. Elijah, and incidentally, Mr. Donahue, you've testified before the Ways and Means Committee many times, and I've, I've heard your testimony many times. I substantially agree with your testimony on NAFTA. Mr. Thoreau says that uh, the potential exists for a substantial portion of the American workforce to experience lower wages as a result of that. I mean, that's only an economist could use the word only preceding two-thirds of the workforce. Uh, no politician would or could do that. Uh, Mr. Elijah, I must say that, that I'm as confused as Senator Hollings is about such an avid support of NAFTA and then suggesting that uh, GATT uh, needs to be modified or you don't support it. I'd see parallels in, in NAFTA and GATT with respect to the direction that was taken by U.S. negotiators in both. The same negotiators were making the same mistakes in both areas. And I would, I'm as confused, I guess, as Senator Hollings is for you to say, gee, this, this thing with Mexico is terrific, but GATT's all wet. That doesn't make sense to me either. Well, you've spent enough of your life working on complicated things to know that there can be substantial differences between agreements, even though under a particular heading they're supposed to be in the same category. My criticism of the, of the Uruguay round is it really undercuts significantly the North American Free Trade Agreement. And for our industry, the benefit flows to uh, Pakistan and India and China and, and, and erodes any of the advantage in this country, I think in a lot of products, and incidentally I think there are a lot of people who oppose the Uruguay round who would support NAFTA, because the Uruguay language gives too much benefit to other trading blocks. You know, the world is not globalizing. The word, world is creating large trading blocks. And so we tend to oversimplify and think of this as one big world where everything is going to move free. That's not going to happen. And I think, you know, it's a, little, it's a little risky for me to get on subjects like this with Dr. Thoreau at the table. But it will globalize on some products and regionalize on many others. And one of the reasons, one of the answers to your question, Senator, is the Japanese have kept the high value added pr uh, uh, processes in their country. And they have continued to train their workforce, and we've all heard about those things and exported the low value added jobs to other countries. Thailand has been given as an example. So that the, the ratio of foreign, in quotes, investment in a Japanese made product is significantly higher than it is in an American made product. Well, first of all, we have a huge market, so we don't go looking for other places to try and build these things. But also because the Japanese, I think, have very wisely found ways to assemble products the, the low value added jobs with low cost labor and preserve the high value added jobs for their own country. And so my view is not that this is a U.S. trade agreement alone. It's a hemispheric trade agreement that gives all the countries in this hemisphere access to a wide variety of technologies. And one of those technologies is low cost labor. And that's what the Japanese have done. And they've done it in electronics. Can, can, I make, ship the product from other can I make an observation here on this yeah. point? See, no. if you were thinking strategically about trade blocks, 
you would never ask Mexico to be the first member to join. <laughs> You'd go off and pick off the Koreas, the Taiwans, or even the Thailands, because the, Thai, the Thais bring you a wage rate that's roughly Mexican, but a much better educated workforce than Mexico has. And so if you're saying, hey, we're doing this for strategic reasons, you never would start with Mexico. You'd start with some other country in the world and ask them to join an American trading bloc. Because in a modern world, having them next to you makes no difference. You don't have to have them on your borders. You can have a member of your trading bloc on the other side of the world. And from a point of view of strategy, a Taiwan or a Korea would bring a lot more cards to the table than a Mexico. But Taiwan and Korea are not next door. And first, we should help our neighbors. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Donahue. just not strategy, that's charity. Just so that the record doesn't close with me being labeled by my friend Senator Dorgan as a protectionist here, let me, let me just note that, that uh, I believe, yeah, I, I would even accept the label. Um, I think the American Trade Union Movement is an institution designed to protect its members. I think nations were designed to protect the people who live within them. I believe that very deeply. Uh, I, this nation was not formed to, to protect the interests of the Canadians or the Mexicans or anyone else who's formed to protect our own. Um, Dr. Thoreau talks about a global economy and a role for governments, and I believe that very deeply. I believe in a global economy. We're clearly moving in that direction. I believe there is a role for government. I believe that what this committee is dealing with is a leftover of an administration which didn't believe there was a role for government. Free trade leaves out governments entirely. Free trade says, no, leave it to Mr. Leisha and others to run the world. Free trade says there's no rule for government. NAFTA is here before you as a leftover of an administration that didn't believe there was a role for government in trade and wanted to get it out of it. Uh, there, there were comments about the, the uh, Mr. Elisha likes the agreement for good reason. The yarn, this, the textile is protected from yarn through uh, to the finished product. The, and, and, and I commend that uh, piece of the agreement. I think that's a desirable protection of, of U.S. textile uh, employees. Uh, the, when we tried to pass a bill in this Congress some years ago that was called, called for a certain percentage of domestic content, domestic content was bad. That's protectionist. But rules of origin for three countries are apparently good. I hope someday someone will explain the difference to me because the rule of origin is a domestic content rule multiplied by three. And that's all it is, but suddenly it's become good. I think there is a, a massive debate to be had as to whether we ought to have trading blocks or shouldn't have trading blocks, whether GATT or, or uh, uh, trading blocks should, should uh, be the, the wind-up. Uh, you've heard this morning so much about, well, if not the NAFTA, then what? Well, <laughs> that's starting the argument from the wrong end. I can think of a lot of things that would, would be better than a NAFTA, and I think what we ought to do is tear it up, begin a renegotiation looking to a common market, looking to common external tariffs, looking to common currencies, looking to controls which would stabilize the growth in three countries and bring a along a real harmonization up, not a harmonization down, that NAFTA is going to produce. Uh, I, I think that, that Mexico did not uh, negotiate the NAFTA to become our export platform. Negotiated, uh, Mexico negotiated the NAFTA because they want absolute access to the U.S. market. So, so they're not ready to be our export market. They want us to be their market for, for the sale and consumption of goods. And, and the, by and large, the investment community in the United States shares that view because they can produce cheaper in Mexico and ship back here. Well, in just a second, we'll let you go here. When you talk, I, I just jump it up and down here because you're talking about the government. Uh, heavens above, every one of us in the game, and I've been in it now 40 years, uh, go specifically to BMW. We just attracted it. How can you talk about free trade and then bring in BMW with a $130 billion package? Mr. Elijah and I are going to pay the taxes. Uh, the government's putting on us to develop the ports facilities. We had the Ports Authority go up there and buy the site. We've got the training program. I'm very proud because von Kuhnheim comes and says, Senator, we came on account of your excellent skills, and I know I got those illiterates off the farms and what have you, but they come in and they get the training, and they're just as productive or the most productive. So we pay for the training program. Uh, we pay for the airport expansion and everything else of that kind. We build an airport farm. We put all the government. That's why I don't bash Japan. In fact, I was the emperor. I'd run it the same way. It's working. Their, their operation is to get market share. I've been bashing Washington because, right, uh, uh, Dr. Thoreau, when we lost electronics, when Zenith appeared, one of the last cases, 
the Justice Department appeared against the American manufacturer. And we have just gone it all over, so you've got the demeaning sight of a president of the United States running to Tokyo with some automobile folks. Please buy some parts. Man, come on. Uh, that's, that's the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. All you've got to do is get into the market, make it competitive, make it to the economic interest, and the Japanese will buy all your auto parts. In fact, we're selling them right now from Greenville, South Carolina, automobile carpet, uh, all the way to Tokyo. So we believe in doing business, and we don't bash, but, uh, and we're interested in uh, other industries as well. Uh, I never forget competing with... Uh, Governor Hodges of North Carolina, and I won out. I got Eastman Kodak, and I've been watching Jim Robinson have a lot of trouble up there, and they said they're going to have to sell off a bunch of things. And then I pick up yesterday morning's paper, Mr. Elijah. Eastman Kodak said its Eastman Chemical Company unit will build a plant in Mexico to make polyethylene terephthala bottle polymer. Well, look out. Two years from now, Carolina Eastman, watch it. That worries me. So it's not just textiles, it's everything. They're all moving down. They're all moving down. And you see, when you talk about how you're competitive, I'd put in the record the story about little Vincent Guerrero, the 12-year-old, the best student in the class from the Wall Street Journal. The teacher goes there and says, come on back into the class. You can go on to college. And he says, how much do you make? The teacher says, 120,000 pesos. He says, I'm making 180,000. So the 12-year-olds, and there's no question, we lifted this out of the computer from the National Institute of Statistics, Geography, and Informatics from, from Mexico, your partner for growth, yesterday, and it says, and I quote, it includes population of 12 years and over that didn't have a job the week before the survey and have been looking for it. So that's where you're going, and here I find out and I agree with Dr. Freeman, one possibility is for us to become a class society like those in Latin America, which have unequal distributions of wealth and chronically unstable government, says Richard B. Freeman, an economist at Harvard. That's the direction we're headed. That's what's really worrying me, and that's why we got you distinguished gentlemen up this morning, because if I could do it, uh, I would in, in a day or a week or a year, but it's going to take a good 25 years where you've got 4% of our income, 10% of our wages, uh, the 12-year-olds and under, no Magna Carta, which I'm sure Mr. Elijah Favors forget, but no Magna Carta for child labor and all these other things for NAFTA. Uh, it, it will take a steady, uh, the economists tell me, a good 9% growth per year for 25 years to begin to build under that circumstance. So what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years is the middle class is going down even further as uh, we work downwards uh, rather than upwards with respect to our standard of living. Again, I supported the one with Canada. We've got the same standard, but not with Mexico. The record will stay open for questions uh, by the uh, committee, and we are very, very grateful to each of you this morning. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ready to be in recess. All right, sir. The Clinton administration has said it hopes that Congress will vote on the North American Free Trade Agreement by the end of this year. The agreement is scheduled to take effect beginning in 1994. Send your comments about this hearing to the sponsor, the Senate Commerce Committee. The address is room 254 of the Russell Office Building, and that's in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20510.
This program is part of C-SPAN's 24-hour-a-day programming that can be used by teachers for educational purposes. C-SPAN in the Classroom. Showing government and the public policy process at work. A group of Republican congressmen have been reviewing the state of the U.S. economy and ways to encourage job growth and creation. Yesterday at a meeting up on Capitol Hill, the House Republican Conference's Task Force on the Economy heard from economist Milton Friedman. Coming next on C-SPAN, we'll show you that meeting. Also, there were a number of House GOP leaders. I think we, you will soon find we've got some of the finest minds in the Republican conference at the table already. You, many of these folks know that I have never been bashful about acknowledging my heroes. I think this is a nation that should cherish heroes and I think we as a, as a culture should teach our children to have and to cherish their heroes. And uh, as, as most of these folks know, Milton Friedman is a hero of mine, having made a, I believe, a disciplined decision to become a professional economist for a lifetime. Obviously, it was for me a great inspiration to have the works of Professor Friedman. You know him as a Nobel laureate and an advisor to presidents, as a writer of an incredibly good books, a producer of one of the most learned uh, uh, shows on public TV, uh, free to choose, and a person who always can speak sense on the subject of economics in a language we can all understand. I have defined economics to my students over the years as the uh, discipline that tells you things you've known all your life in a language you can't understand. <laughs> Dr. Friedman tells us things that are ordinarily too complex for us to comprehend in a language we can understand. So, <laughs> Professor Friedman, it is for me an extraordinary pleasure to welcome you here among the Republican Conference. The, the, uh, uh, Professor Friedman has agreed that he will speak briefly and then open it up for a dialogue of questions and responses. Thank you, Congressman Army. I may tell you that my first contact with Congressman Army was when he was not a congressman but a professor at Texas A&M and I was at that time writing Newsweek columns and I wrote a Newsweek column uh, di uh, directed to the topic of the fact that most well almost essentially every well-intentioned law always produce produces results which are the opposite of those that were intended, the unintended consequences of these laws. And I said, why isn't there a good name for this, like Murphy's Law or something like that, that would keep it in the public attention? And I asked readers to send in suggestions. And I got a whole bunch of suggestions, and the suggestion that I liked best and put was at the top of the list was from <laughs> your colleague. And he said, why don't we call it the invisible foot of government? <laughs> And I, I have been using that ever since. I give credit to Dick Army when I do, but I think that was a marvelous way of putting it. Your mention of the PBS station is a thing uh, is important from a different point of view. PBS is consistently hostile to programs that have a free market, private enterprise perspective. And the only reason why Free to Choose was ever got on public television was because a year before they had run John Kenneth Scalbrace's series on uh, uh, Age of Uncertainty. And the contrast was so sharp that they were shamed into letting this on. But in 19, a few years ago, three or four years ago, we did a kind of a little update of Free to Choose in which we had five programs instead of ten, had new discussions and included one new program dealing with Eastern Europe. And PBS, we could not get PBS to carry it. 
So I think one of the, it, it's a nice illustration of how uh, governmental agencies, which PBS really is, get turned into a, uh, propaganda agencies, not necessarily by those people who are supposed to run them, but by the simple bureaucracy. Because the board that's supposed, the PBS board that's supposed to run it, is typically cons has uh, open-minded, public-spirited individuals on it who would be much more uh, tolerant of a variety of views. But the final decisions are made by the bureaucracy. That's the same thing you've experienced in the Endowment for the Humanities, Endowment for the Arts, the same thing everywhere. Uh, I, I'm going to, mostly I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have. I might say in opening simply that uh, I regard the economic problems we're facing as, a relative, uh, as significant but not of great importance because what's destroying this country at the moment are not the economic problems. We're fundamentally, economically, a very strong country. And in uh, Adam's, the words I always cite from Adam Smith when a young man uh, uh, said that the defeat of Cornwallis at Yorktown was going to be the ruination of Britain, Adam Smith said, young man, there's a deal of ruin in a nation. And there's a deal of ruin in a nation. But the major problems we face are, in my opinion, the social non-economic problems of deteriorating education, collapsing families, uh, increasing crime and lawlessness, uh, you can name them, you know the litany of them, almost all of which have been produced by and are attributable to government actions. And that's the real, uh, government has done a lot of bad things in the economic area, don't misunderstand me. We all have a long litany of them. <coughs> And those are capable of doing a great deal of harm over a longer period. But the more immediate present danger, in my opinion, is the harm that is being done to the basic character of our society by these non-economic social problems, which government is at the source of almost invariably. Yes. Thank well, you. let's go ahead. I'm sorry. I, um, I understand what you're saying, but... Uh, doesn't the uh, economy and the well-being of, uh, of this country have something to do with part of that? When you have a flourishing economy and you have a low uh, unemployment rate and you have families that are not uh, going through the trauma that they are going through now with either unemployment or the threat of unemployment, uh, don't you feel that that adds to the, the, the dilemma? Uh, very, to a very minor extent, but suppose you look at these problems and ask whether that's the source of them. The declining, deteriorating education has nothing to do with that. The deterior you have deteriorating education because you have a government monopoly, you have a socialized educational industry, which is performing like all socialized industries. It's producing a bad product at high cost with a, a small special groups getting great benefits and the large unwashed masses paying the costs. And that has almost nothing to do with the problems of unemployment or of economic conditions. Lawlessness, crime and uh, 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 growth of crime and the uh, unlivability of the inner cities has far more to do with a futile attempt to prohibit drugs than it has to do with unemployment or current economic matters. Uh, so I agree with you that what you're describing are contributing factors. And I would agree also that our present economic policies are bad. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not coming out in favor of those economic policies. I, like to ask I think a government is too big and ought to be cut down to size. I think taxes are too high and ought to be reduced. I think government is largely responsible, is in considerable part responsible to the high level of unemployment. Let me cite you one figure that I came across recently that really I think will shock you. As we all know, in 1946, the government passed a Full Employment Act, which involved government taking responsibility for achieving full employment. The average level of unemployment from that day to this has been 5.7 percent. What do you suppose the average rate of unemployment was between 1900 and 1929, when federal government spending was 3 percent of the national income? 4.6 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a fundamental difference there. 
that period, you still had tremendous American growth based on a rising demand from an increasingly prosperous middle class in the cities. You're in and and what you had in the Second World War was where you had the lowest employment of the century. Why? Because everybody was fully employed. And uh, that's far different than what you've run into in a more static economy with less economic growth in the last 40 years. First of all, let's get the facts straight. In the early years of the 20th century saw an enormous inflow of immigrants from abroad. Right. The largest number, of, the largest flow of immigrants percentage-wise, all, almost all of whom were unskilled, had no capital, that surely raised problems comparable to those we have now. Second place, the period, the 25 years after World War II, saw the most rapid rate of economic growth of almost any 25-year period you can go back. The economic growth has been slower, and productivity in particular has declined since about the 1970s, the early 70s. And I believe that has very little to do uh, with the level of unemployment that has much more to do with the extent to which government spending was going up, government tax rates were going up, and you were taking away the whole incentives for achieving a rapid rate of economic growth. Much of the jobs of the early 20th century, you didn't need an education to get them. Physical brawn would take care of it. Uh, of course. And, and that's why of they course, adapted but, so easily. Excuse me, sir. As the demand for more educated people came along, the more edu those people became educated. They got the skill. They developed the skills. Let me give you a different example, if I may. Because that argument uh, doesn't face to the fact that people are very sensitive to incentives and will react to them. Here's Hong Kong. 1945. Three or four hundred, five hundred thousand people. An enormous inflow uh, people from China, again, with empty hands for the most part, though some of them brought capital, some of them were entrepreneurs and businessmen, uh, mostly unskilled. And Hong Kong in its early days produced junk. It's now a high-tech place. No government involvement. Very little. Government spending in Hong Kong, never above about 12% of, of their national income, went from 400,000 to over 5 million a tripling of a per capita rate of uh, income, level of income, and essentially no unemployment problem. You have unemployment because the government prevents people from being employed. <coughs> Minimum wage law, the uh, fringe benefits that are required to be done, the, uh, all of the, you know better than I do, all of the burdens that are placed on an employer. Yeah. And so what happens? Employers prefer to hire part-time people. They prefer to work their current people over time. They try to put off as long as they can, adding more people to their staff. It's a very bad idea. But our people, it's always been a mystery to me. Why people, it should be thought that people are better off unemployed at, let's say, $3 an hour than employed at $2 an hour. Why are they better off unemployed at $3 an hour? Uh, Professor Friedman, let me intercede a, a thought, one, to reinforce that point, the front page story on the German employment problems t in today's Wall Street Journal focuses again on that point, what they've done to raise labor costs. Jan Meyer from, uh, from uh, the, the great state of Kansas, Kansas City Royals country, has a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the Kansas City area. Just before I came over here, Dr. Friedman, one of my legislative assistants, who is very bright, said that he went to the University of Chicago because of the free-to-choose uh, programs. And so I think sometimes uh, when you do something like that, you don't realize what a big net you're casting and how wide the influence is. Um, I, I don't expect you to uh, react to this immediately, but I would like your thinking on something um, Either, either now or at, at a later time, if you're more comfortable with it. Um, I've been very concerned um, with the fact that we don't seem to be able to get a handle on the entitlements in this country. And I always make a sharp difference between the entitlements and the trust fund programs. I'm not talking about Social Security or Medicare. I am talking about 
the, the programs where we describe the parameters in the law and then if you fit into that parameter, you're, you're entitled to money. And it has seemed to me that taxes will go on uh, and the problems with the budget will go on until we get a handle on uh, the entitlements. And so I have introduced a bill with an, a number of co-sponsors that says uh, that we will freeze AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, at the 92 level and send it back to the state in block grants so that we won't continually enact welfare reform uh, bills at the federal level that don't work. And it, it saves money, but it also keeps us from doing other foolish things. Um, and then the bill says two additional things. Uh, that there would not be AFDC unless both parents were 18, and that there would not be AFDC at any age until paternity is established. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I am not an uncompassionate person. In fact, sometimes people have accused me of being too involved with social programs, but I, I think that we have gotten so far away from establishing the responsibility uh, of parenthood with the mother and father of the child, and we have almost made uh, the federal government in many cases kind of a surrogate parent. I think we have thought about our own teenage pregnancy epidemic. Uh, I think we're responsible for a lot of problems of kids that are born with no man in the house and no real family and they grow up sometimes, not always by any means, but sometimes without sufficient attention and then the things happen that you were mentioning, we have problems uh, <coughs> with education and crime and drugs and gangs and that sort of thing. Um, since AFDC also kind of is the driver behind food stamps and Medicaid and housing and um, a, a lot of other programs, it has seemed to me if we could get people to accept the responsibility um, for, for children and families again, uh, that um, we could get a handle on all of the entitlements, but it really isn't the money I'm as much in, uh, concerned with as the human lives, because I do think that we have raised a generation, maybe a generation and a half, of, of young people that sometimes just don't have any roots. No, I agree with you completely on that aspect of it. Indeed, um, one of the things that is fascinating and baffling and disturbing is that we as a collectivity do things in our collective capacity that we would never dream of doing in our individual capacity. In respect of exactly the problem you've raised, I've asked people, I've said, suppose you had a teenage daughter. Would you tell her, now if you behave yourself and you don't have any children or anything, you can stay and live at home and we'll, have a, uh, we'll provide for you. But on the other hand, if you go and have a baby, We'll set you up in a separate apartment, you can live by yourself, and we'll finance you so that you can finance yourself without having to go to work and have a separate apartment all for yourself. No parent would ever tell a teenage daughter that. I can't believe you would tell your daughter that. I wouldn't tell my daughter if I, my daughter is much older now, but I wouldn't have when she was a teenager. And yet we collectively essentially tell them that. And we provide a tremendous incentive for exactly what you're describing, the teenage pregnancies, the, uh, uh, the uh, AFDC mothers who are 16, 15, 16, one generation after another breeding another. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I'm not competent to judge your specific uh, solution to it, but the general principle, it seems to me, and one of the, well, let me put it in another way, in 1929, total government spending in the United States was about 11 or 12 percent, and two-thirds of that was state and local. Federal government expenditure was about 3 or 4 percent of national income. Today, total government spending is 43 percent of national income, and two-thirds of that is federal, 30 percent roughly. And I believe one of the great sources of the deterioration in the quality of our social life and the social aspects of our life comes from the shift of 
We have emphasis and responsibility from the states to the central government. And any program which has the potential of reversing that and putting the states more in charge and reducing the responsibilities and the undertaken by the federal government seems to me is a very good thing. Whether your particular way of doing that, as you know, there was under the Nixon administration the introduction of block grants, mm -hmm. which turned out not to work as people anticipated. And as we were saying earlier, very few programs do work as anticipated. My own feeling has been about entitlements uh, a little different, including AFDC and others. We have too many separate individual programs. You have AFDC, you have food stamps, you have God knows what. You people are much more knowledgeable about this than I, and I'm sure you can list them. Now, what it seems to me you ought to do is to get rid of all of them and replace the whole collection of them by something I argued for many years ago called the negative income tax. And this has two purposes. One is to give people money instead of a whole lot of separate little baffles and get rid of the bureaucracy that is involved in all these programs. Uh, because what happens, the pressure for expanding these programs does not come from the people who benefit, if they benefit at all. It comes from the bureaucracy that administers it. You've got a self-generating monstrosity here. And so I would say if you can abandon, if you get rid of all of these other programs. However, the problem with the kind of thing you're advising is that it tends to be put on top of everything else. It's an added program. That's what happened to the block grants in the Nixon administration. And so I think it's very important to design your program in such a way as to minimize that possibility. If I might just, Professor, take a moment, sure. show off a little bit. I can tell, tell the, my colleagues that in the professor's book on price theory, there's an excellent demonstration of the greater efficiency of the negative income tax by use of the Slutsky income variation. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that. My staff's going to kill me. But we have Bill Baker from California that has indicated he'd like to. Dr. Friedman, thank you for coming here today. Um, Glad to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a freshman. I've been here about four months, as many of the people at the table, and I was convinced when we came that these bushy-tailed new reformers would be able to turn this thing around in a matter of months. Before we were sworn in, the Democrats were co-opted uh, by their leadership and all the pork that flows around this place, and we haven't heard a word in reform from them since. Uh, the 47 Republican freshmen stayed together uh, for at least three months, but last week all but 12 of us voted for a placebo known as a enhanced rescission, which is worse than what we have now. So I've given up on the Republicans staying together. <laughs> Question, if you were a freshman member, it's similar to being a mosquito in a nudist camp, what target would you attack first? The overspending or attempting to stimulate the private sector and overwhelm government spending by getting rid of, uh, let's say, capital gains tax, increasing depreciation allowance. Noting that we don't have a lot of chance to pass anything, where would you apply your time? Would you work on this reducing of spending or stimulating the real world economy? I, I, I really am not sure I know how to answer that question because I fortunately or unfortunately have not had the experience. But uh, I don't believe you can, I doubt very much that you can separate it out that way. I think you ha either have to work on it, you have to work on a package. You, uh, the most important thing, I think, at the initial stage, is to prevent a rise in taxes of any kind, any shape whatsoever. Because that's going to increase spending. It's not going to reduce the deficit. Stop the bleeding. Huh? On the capital gains tax, I believe that the Republicans have been, in my opinion, very foolish in the way they've approached that. Indexing capital, the base of capital gains, would do far more good than a cut in the tax rate. It's more potent in raising the value of property around the country. It's more potent in giving a stimulus to new investment. And I may say, let me go back. There's a good deal of talk around about how the Clinton program is a program of change. That's nonsense. The Bush program was a program of change. I think to talk about the 12 years of Reagan-Bush is utter nonsense. Reaganomics, lower marginal tax rates, 
less regulation, uh, restrained government spending. The Bush program, as it worked out, raised marginal tax rates, increased regulation, increased government spending. As I, I wrote in a Newsweek, as in a New York Times op-ed piece, my title was Reverse uh, Reaganomics, uh, and they titled it, uh, uh, well, you remember when uh, Bush was running for vice president, he called it uh, voodoo. voodoo. And so they gave it a title, Uduv <laughs> <laughs> Economics. But that's what, uh, what it was. And so now, so what's the Bush on the economic side? The Bush program was higher tax rates, more regulation, bigger spending. What is the Clinton program? Still higher tax rates, still more regulation, still more spending. So far from being a change, the Clinton program is Bush writ large. It's an expanded version of Bush's program. Well, that's really off the track from your, uh, uh, from your comment. But I do think that the most essential thing is to stop the increase in taxes. Thank you. Let me uh, introduce Nick Smith from Michigan, another one of our freshmen. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Friedman, you're one of my heroes. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, uh, uh, whether it's NAFTA or whether it's the problem of getting jobs, we're, we're hearing more and more talk about uh, uh, what I consider isolationism with a suggestion that we can't compete with uh, uh, the dollar an hour wages in other countries. What do you see as the, as the short run and long uh, run solution for this country? First of all, oh, there's no doubt in my mind what the short, what the, both the short run and the long run is. What, what some are saying the short run is, is, free is trade. more transfer of wealth, so it seems like we're just as well off. But <laughs> Free trade. But let me go back. One of the things that baffles me is the extent to which people regard the trade deficit as a, as a bad thing. Let's go back. The Japanese have a very large trade deficit. They have a surplus, in that, from their point of view, a deficit from our, what is it, 50 billion? Right now, what have they been doing with that 50 billion dollars over the last 10 years? Giving it to us. They've been making Americans rich. They've been buying golf courses at inflated prices. <coughs> They've been buying uh, property at inflated prices. Almost every one of their investments has gone sour. How have we been hurt by that? We've gotten good goods. We've gotten automobiles. We've gotten uh, can recorders. We've gotten all sorts of nice things. And they've gotten bad investments. And insofar as they've had good investments, like the Honda plants or some of those, it's added to our stock of capital. It's provided employment for our people. It's increased our productivity. Have we lost by that, or have they lost by that? Why should we be worried about these deficits? From the point of view of the consumer of the... You see, let me put it to you another way. When I look at legal legislation, it almost always seems to me that legislation is enacted to benefit a small group at the expense of a large group. Free trade is a way of benefiting a large group at the expense of a small group. But Politically, a small group always speaks with a bigger voice. If you were to take a referendum in this country, take a free trade issue, take any free trade issue you want. Sugar in the United States now costs what? Two to three times as much as it does in the world because of sugar quotas? Suppose you were to have a, re a national referendum to the Housewives of America. Uh, we have a choice. We can provide you with sugar from American cane and uh, beet sugar uh, at a price which is twice what we can provide you with sugar from El Salvador or elsewhere, Philippines. Which would you rather have? Is there any doubt what the consumers would vote for? Suppose at the time one of my heroes, Mr. Reagan, made the great mistake of going along with voluntary import quotas on Japanese cars. <coughs> Suppose you had had a referendum of all automobile users in the United States which said, are you willing to pay $2,000 extra a car in order to retain a few extra jobs in, in, uh, Detroit, in Michigan uh, in the automobile industry? 
Do you really think you would have gotten an overwhelming vote in favor of that? We, we aren't doing what the people want. We're, do, we're doing what certain special interests, including as a special interest, the government bureaucracies. The reasons the programs you're dealing with expand is because it's in the self-interest of the people who run them to have them expand. But can, can we expect our standard of living to go down? It, I mean, there is... If, which, that, if we have more, more good Japanese goods to have our investment... No, no, I was thinking as, as we have total free trade, as other countries start learning the techniques of, of, of production... As we have more free trade or less? Pardon? More free trade or less? More. I'm saying more free trade. If we have more free trade, we benefit. Look, well, are you worse off... To the because extent that Japan is more productive? On the contrary. If Japan is more productive, they have goods and services that you can buy from them at better prices. And they have more money and more resources to buy goods and services from us or to invest in our country. At least they got our dollars they got to do something with. They got to do something. What are they going to do with the dollars? The key, the reason why people are so mixed up, in my opinion, about free trade, there are two reasons. One is the propaganda from the producers. But the other is that they don't recognize the role of a floating exchange rate as, a, as something. Suppose for a moment, in the vision that people give, that everything in Japan was cheaper than everything in the United States. Okay? And so we want to buy all of Japan. They're willing to sell us. And they get dollars. But they don't want to buy anything in the United States because we're all too expensive. What are they going to do with those dollars? They're going to try to buy yen. How can they buy yen? Only by offering a better price for yen. But as they offer a better price for yen, the Japanese goods get more expensive and the U.S. goods get less expensive. You can't compare costs between countries. The costs here are in dollars, the costs there are in yen. And which is cheaper depends on what the exchange rate is. And the exchange rate balances in su uh, moves in such a way as to uh, uh, make sure that everybody who wants to get dollars can get them, everybody who wants to get yens can get them. The reason why Japan has had a balance of payment surplus has nothing to do with all the nonsense you hear about dumping and all the rest. It has to do with the fact that they've been saving a larger fraction of their income than we have. And they have to do something with their savings. And the opportunities for investing it at home are limited. And so the investments in the United States are more attractive to them. I assure you that if we were to, if our rate of saving would get to be higher than theirs, we'd have the surplus and they'd have, a, they'd have the deficit. You know, I want to tell you the best argument I've ever heard for free trade. And this comes from Henry George. Henry George was a who was a single taxer who wrote Progress and Poverty, the great book, a, a bestseller of the 1890s. Hi, Dana. And uh, uh, he wrote once, it's a very interesting thing, in time of war, we blockade our enemies in order to prevent them from getting goods from us. In time of peace, we do to ourselves by tariffs what we do to our enemy in time of war. <laughs> Isn't that a marvelous way of putting it? Absolutely. It's as good as Basquiat's petition of the camel. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> if, I, if I might just take a moment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Rob Portman, our newest member from Ohio, just, just elected. Here, here. And I want to welcome you to the uh, Economics Task Force, Rob. Thank you. I don't think it's always this exciting, but uh, <laughs> we do want you to come back. Uh, I have uh, three people that have indicated to me they'd like to ask a question. Uh, Lamar Smith, Tom Ewing, and Jay Kim. Lamar Smith is sporting the Adam Smith tie, so we know his, his question will be nice. right. uh, I see there are three, at least three Adam Smith, Smith ties, ties in the table. table. Well, I'm biased. Dick Army gave me this tie, so I'm required to wear it whenever I'm around him. <laughs> uh, Dr. Friedman, I'd like to ask you about three subjects. Uh, the first is the free trade agreement, whether you think that's going to have as positive an impact on the American economy as I think it is. Uh, the, the American sec economy. Positive, economy yeah. of an, uh, positive impact on the economy yeah. as I think it is. The second is the energy tax, the BTU tax, whether that's going to have as negative 
of an impact on the economy as, as I think it is. And then lastly, how much do you think that we can cut government overhead and personnel uh, realistically? Well, answer to the first question is that uh, free trade, and let me be careful here, free trade would unquestionably have a positive effect on the American economy. If we were unilateral with no agreements, simply to abolish all our duties, quotas, and everything, mm -hmm you would have a period of great prosperity. Because you would suddenly be in a position to make the best use of your own resources and to acquire <coughs> most cheaply from anywhere in the world those things that are going. The free, so-called free trade treaty, NAFTA, is not a free trade treaty. It's a managed trade treaty. And it has many provisions in it which I do not like. But taken as a whole, mm -hmm. I think it's better than the alternative of what we have now. And taken as a whole, I strongly support it. And I believe it would unquestionably have positive effects for our economy. Uh, on your... Uh, energy tax? On your second question, the energy tax, I am opposed to any taxes <laughs> of any kind. <laughs> I, I have always said, I have a very simple philosophy on taxes. I'm in favor of cutting taxes at any time, anyhow, anywhere, for any reason. <laughs> because the rule, I believe, is that government will spend whatever the tax system will raise, plus as much more as it thinks it can get away with. Mm -hmm. And I think you will find it hard to find any historical evidence contradicting that proposition. Yeah. So, as a technical economist, you can make a case for an energy tax, at least for some kind of an energy tax, mm -hmm. on the ground of the uh, <clears throat> external costs that are imposed on others by energy, and in particular in the case of oil. You can make, there, as a technical economist, I hate to say this, but this is correct, economics, you can make a case for a special tariff on imported oil. Not all imported oil. Mm -hmm. not for imported oil from Venezuela or from Canada or from Mexico, but because of the costs imposed on the country right. through military activity and otherwise, if a large fraction of our oil comes from, a, uh, from the Persian Gulf. However, I do not favor that in practice, because you start that road, you'll, you'll never get off mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's like the VAT tax. Technically, the VAT is a very efficient tax. Politically, it's absolutely a disaster because it's invisible, it's so productive that it's a standing temptation to the legislators to increase it. Every country in Europe that has introduced it has increased it. Every country in the industrialized nations, as Steve Moore got some figures up for me, mm -hmm. that has a VAT tax has a higher ratio of government spending to income than any country that does not have a VAT tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a VAT tax, I think, would be politically disastrous. But economically, it's a highly efficient technical way of squeezing the uh, suckers down below. <laughs> so I'm not in favor of an energy okay. tax. And the case I make is a very narrow one and would not apply to the broad-based energy tax you're talking about now. Uh, on the third issue, what was your third issue? The third issue was how much do you feel that we can oh, cut yeah. government overhead and personnel. Well, and by the way, I agree with you on the first two issues. That you know, I can't give you a serious answer on that because, in my opinion, the right size for government is about roughly one fifth of where it is now. <laughs> uh -huh. As I believe that, that history suggests. The total government spending in the United States, and that also has to do with a number of people hired and overhead, history suggests that the right answer for the appropriate total number, amount of spending is about uh, 10 to 15 percent of national income. I always say 10 percent. The church tithe, when Queen Victoria was at the peak of her power at the time of her jubilee at the end of the 19th century, total government spending in Britain was 10 percent of the national income. In the United States before 1929, government spending, except in time of war, was about 10% of the national income. So 10% seems like about right. And that would mean that you could get rid of four-fifths of it. 
But as a practical matter, I have never been persuaded that if you simply cut the number of people in every agency of government across the board by 10 percent once and then 10 percent another time, you wouldn't get greater output. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. By the way, I propose, I want to tell you I, I propose that very same thing, cut 10 percent at I least I want to give you year. a little, a, a couple of numbers that I, sure. I, I like. I'm going to use it tonight in this talk I'm going to give. Uh, in 1945 uh, or 50, there were 10 million people employed on farms, both owners, family, and employed. And there were 80,000 employees of the Department of Agriculture. Hmm. Today, there are 3 million people employed on farms, and there are 122,000 employees of the Department of Agriculture. If you want to know how to spend money, how to save money, you ought to start by eliminating the Department of Agriculture and all its appropriations. <laughs> I'd like somebody to explain. <laughs> I'd like somebody to explain to me how it makes sense to spend 54 billion dollars a year on a Department of Agriculture when the total net income from agriculture is 60 billion. Thank you. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, let me just say, you uh, now know why he's one of my heroes. <laughs> but you know, you also know that I'm an academic. Absolutely, and it's a lot safer for him to talk that way. I've always <laughs> said that the only people who have complete freedom of speech are tenured professors on the verge of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, and I'm long retired, so I have double freedom of speech. <laughs> let me introduce Tom Ewing from your uh, state of Illinois. One of, your One of my yes. former state of Illinois, sure. Yes, and, and from the uh, greatest agricultural district. In <laughs> <laughs> and I would uh, just uh, point out that uh, two-thirds of the department's employees deal with food stamps and social programs and not with agricultural programs. Uh, Ed Madigan would want me to remind you. Oh, yes. Uh, the question well, I let have... Let me take you back. Hold on. I want to give you another <laughs> fact. One, one good fact deserves another. Okay. In 1950... The item classified as expenditures for stabilizing farm price and incomes amounted to 100, corrected for inflation, adjusted for inflation, amounted to uh, uh, $1,500 per person employed. It now amounts, if I remember, to $4,500. And that's the strictly agricultural part. Doctor, thank you for coming in. But the question I, I really wanted to pose was not in the agricultural yeah. area. Uh, being uh, from a rural area and uh, being a pretty pragmatic uh, business person, I have been uh, very concerned about the escalating deficits and uh, feel that probably that's the most dangerous thing for the Ameri survival of America as we know it today and our economy and wonder what uh, some economists, some at the University of Illinois, which are in my district, say, well, our deficits aren't too large for our uh, gross national product. Uh, I happen to believe they are, and wonder what your thought would be on the well, long-range effect of continued deficits. I do not believe that the real problem is, uh, I don't agree with you at all. Because the real problem is not the debt, but government spending. It's government spending which creates the debt that's a real problem, not the debt itself. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can put this in a very simple way. There's a certain total amount of resources that the United States has available to it. Call it 100. If government spends 50, only 50 is available for private enterprise to use or private individuals to use for consumption and production and saving, investment. Now, so far, I haven't said a word about how this 50 is financed. Whether this 50 is financed 100% by what we call taxes or 100% by what we call borrowing, it's still true that the amount available to the, re to the private system is only half of, what's of the total. And so it's this part that government spends that uses resources. Now, what about the, uh, what difference does it make which way it is financed? It does make a difference. What we call a deficit is simply a form of taxation. It's hidden taxation. It's taxation uh, in several, one of several forms, it may be, if it's, if it's really 
financed by printing money, then it's taxation in the form of inflation. If it's not financed by printing money, it's an invisible tax on all property because you own a piece of property. But you have to figure from the future income of that property then more of it will have to be taken from taxes in order to finance this debt that is here. So it's a, and those are bad taxes. They're not wholly bad taxes, but they're not good taxes. And therefore, I would prefer not to finance by deficits. On the other hand, when people talk about how much damage interest payments are doing to the country, I want you to name me any expenditure of government that does less harm than interest payments. <laughs> Interest payments don't use up any resources. There are no labor, no labor that's unavailable for something else. They're simply a transfer from taxpayers to, uh, to bondholders. They do cost, dead weight cost of collecting the taxes and the effect that has on incentives. So there is a net cost. But there's no resource cost. Let me ask you a different question right now. Let's suppose that the U.S. government, miraculously, the debt were to disappear overnight. And interest payments, which are now what, 100 and, how much? 200, 200 billion. billion. 214 billion. Or 214 billion disappeared overnight. You think the deficit would be reduced by 214 billion? You're oh, suggesting we, we would spend it somewhere. Absolutely, yes. absolutely, absolutely. So I regard the, inter at the moment, in a Congress which will spend everything the tax system will raise, I regard the debt and interest payments as performing a positive function of, of keeping money away from the Congress to waste. Uh, that's very uh, unique. And, and I... Now, let me get back to your basic question about debt. Is there any accumulation of debt which would be bad? Of course. Beyond a certain point, a debt accumulation will not be, a government cannot handle a debt accumulation except by monetizing it. And that produces inflation and that does disastrous harm. So I'm not arguing that a debt is a good thing indefinitely. But at the present moment, in the state of the United States today, the size of the debt is not one, at the, let me point out, at the end of World War II, the federal government debt was a hundred and 20-some percent of national income. And now the net federal government debt is something like 40, 45 percent of national income. We never, I, we never heard these arguments back then. And we managed to survive them and to get the debt down. How? We repudiated the debt through inflation. And that is the great danger, that you will repudiate the debt through inflation. So I'm not saying the debt is a good thing. But under present circumstances, at the present level of the debt, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a harmful, nothing harmful about it. The argument that we're imposing a, uh, a burden on our future generations is utterly false. Who's going to receive the interest in those future generations? Future generations are going to have to pay taxes to pay the interest on the debt, but future generations are going to receive the interest. So once again, you're back in a case where you're transferring. Now, now they're, they're, that's not entirely true, because insofar as a debt is bought by foreigners, that does impose a real burden on future generations. And the real burden we're imposing on future generations is from spending, not from the debt. And why? Because, go back, if 50% is being spent by government, only 50% is left to be used for capital formation or for consumption. Suppose government were spending 40%. Then you would get larger savings and more capital formation, and that would produce a higher income for our children and grandchildren in the future. So it's spending that has all the bad effects that are attributed to the debt, not the debt per se. Well, I, I agree that spending is much too high, and, and to reduce it would be excellent. Would, would you suggest, then, if we were to reduce spending, should we reduce taxes, or should we apply it to the deficit? Well, if you apply it to the deficit, spending will soon increase again. So I think you have to do both. You reduce taxes, 
And you see, reduction of taxes and reduction of spending should go hand in hand. And I think it's desirable that you reduce spending more than you reduce taxes. I'm not questioning that. Moreover, if you reduce tax rates, it's not clear you're going to reduce taxes. In my opinion, for example, if you were to, if you were to, uh, in the capital gains tax, if you were to index the base for capital gains, and don't do anything about the rate, you'd increase the revenue you got from tax capital gains, and you'd also increase economic growth, which would bring you more subsidiary revenue. Again, go back to the deficit. Because people talk about the deficit as if it's a hard real number. The total amount of spending by the government is a pretty hard number. But the deficit isn't a real hard number. Let me illustrate again, going back to interest. You pay 200 and some billion dollars in interest. But part of that is just simply a compensation for inflation. It's not a real cost. If prices are going up 5% a year, and I own a government bond, and I get 10% interest, let's say, on it, 5% uh, of that is simply allowing for inflation. And incidentally, one of the other things that ought to be indexed are, is the interest payments. You ought to permit corporations to deduct only interest in excess of the rate of inflation. And you ought to require individuals to include in their income only interest in excess of the rate of inflation. Otherwise, you're taxing real returns and not, not I mean, nominal returns and not real returns. So that that's also, but uh, you can see that really the real deficit from that point of view, is smaller than the nominal deficit. There are other things, on the other hand, if you look at it from an accrual point of view, where accumulating obligations for the future under Social Security and under these uh, various long-run programs, uh, so that the true debt, we talk about the debt, people every, the debt is, again, take the debt. People talk about four billion, that's a fake. That's a pure statistical fiction, because a billion of that roughly is owned by the government. So it's just a bookkeeping matter, Social Security and various trust funds and the Federal Reserve System. But that's three billion. But what about the present value of the obligations we've assumed under Social Security, under Medicare and Medicaid? The true debt is probably about 10 trillion. I don't know the exact number, but it's a very much bigger than the so I think the thing to do is to emphasize the programs and cutting spending. And in that case, I want to go back to what you said before. I may say I'm a radical, and I am not a supporter of the Social Security program, even though I am a beneficiary of it. I am not a supporter of the Medicare program, even though I am a beneficiary of it. And I, I, I believe all of those are bad programs which should be but there's no point talking about it, because at the moment, that's so far out of the range of possibility that it's a waste of breath. Let me, uh, let me observe that if the United States uh, government were to find a bank loaning money to the United States government, the FDIC would shut the bank down. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, let me tell you something else on that. If the United States government were to find a broker, a broker who was ch churning his customers' money, the way in which the Federal Reserve churns the government's money, they would be subject to suit. <laughs> That's right. At this point, let me call on Jay Kim, who has been very patient. Jay is another one of our distinguished freshmen and a very uh, effective new member. Well, first time I met you, sir, but I no wonder why a lot of people calling you uh, their hero, and I agree with them. I'm from Southern California. My district is not very far from Los Angeles which had a riot uh, not too long yeah. ago. And uh, every indication, every study uh, indicated that the riot and economic depression has a correlation. You mentioned at the opening remarks that um, the problem we have is not an economy, it's the non-economic issue. And even Rand Corporation stated that the reason why riot is because of economic depression, About uh, economic depression. If we had more job opportunity, we wouldn't have any riots. Can you comment on that? Yes, undoubtedly that's partly true, but I'm, I, I don't believe it's really true. I don't really believe that's the fundamental thing. I think so far as the problem of the inner cities is concerned, 
The war on drugs and the lousy educational system are more responsible for what's going on and the family problem. Those three things, the decline of culture with the, uh, the teenage mothers and so on, the generation after generation of welfare, the war on drugs, which is uh, uh, producing uh, uh, a large number of innocent victims, the people who are shot uh, in the course of uh, fights among drug lords, the people who are mugged. But in the case especially of the, of the inner cities, the fact that they're very, diff very ungovernability makes them ideal centers for distribution of illegal drugs. So the drug problem is, is, is really playing a very large role in their decline because they have become the centers. They don't consume it, but people from outside, from the suburbs and so on, come in to buy it then. And in my opinion, we ought to do to the war on drugs what we did to the war on alcohol. We ought to legalize drugs and get rid of it. It's a disaster. It's doing an enormous amount of harm. In addition, we ought to introduce choice in education, not limited to government schools, but available to, I try to avoid saying public schools. I like to say government schools, because I think Stanford is as much of a public institution as the University of California. At any rate, uh, we ought to have vouchers for educational choice. Uh, <coughs> widespread vouchers. We have an initiative in California, as you know, which will be on the ballot next year. Uh, and uh, we ought to have a reform of the welfare system of the kind that you are speaking about uh, that would uh, remove that. Now, undoubtedly, no, the problem, let me go back. The problems of the inner cities and of the riots and so on have not have not been closely correlated with the state of the economy. We've had them when the economy was prosperous and we've had them when the economy was in the doldrums. The state of the economy is, in my opinion, an excuse that is offered for these things rather than the fundamental reason for it. There are plenty, look, how can the state of the economy be the problem, <coughs> unemployment be the problem, when the immigrants from ch China, from Korea, manage to find jobs and to get work and to earn income under these circumstances. The people in Koreatown were, were uh, uh, devastated in the riots that occurred in Los Angeles because why? They had taken advantage of the opportunities open and were able to make a living for themselves. But if you establish a system under which it's more profitable not to work than to work, then you won't work. So I don't believe you ought to center on the problem of employment. I think from the point of view of the inner cities, the three things I mentioned are the absolute keys. I may say, and on the drug issue, which I feel very strongly about, I may say I've never personally imbibed any drug whatsoever, so any of these drugs whatsoever, so I'm not speaking from personal experience. <laughs> let me, uh, let me... Uh, but I, I want to say just one thing on that. We have uh, a group of us gotten together, headed by a judge from Southern California, and I've drawn up a resolution calling for the establishment of a commission to study the changes that should be made in the drug laws. I hope when it gets to you, you people will sign it. Uh, <laughs> but I don't expect it. Dr. Friedman, we had agreed that we would meet for about an hour. We've had Sorry. a few people come in. Ron Makeley has come in from Rhode Island. And, of course, you know Dana Rohrbacher. I think uh, you've had something to do with trying to keep him on the straight and narrow through his wayward youth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, if, if the gentlemen, or the ladies and gentlemen, would agree, can, may I, since we have less than five minutes, prevail my prerogative as chair and ask the final question? And if I may, uh, with your agreement, I would like to see your reaction to a, a proposal to do something to make our tax system more of a flat tax system. That was very popular in the 80s, and 
some of us are thinking about revising that concept and trying to put a revitalization to it, and we would welcome your remarks on it. Well, I am very strongly in favor of a flat tax, as you know. I proposed it in 1963 in Capitalism and Freedom, and I've never seen any reason to deviate it from it then. And I think that uh, the ideal flat tax in my system would be a flat tax not on income but on spending, but not by VAT, not by sales tax, but by the present type of income tax form in which, however, uh, you are allowed as deductions all additions to uh, assets and as uh, and you had to add all uh, uh, negative all li additions to liability so what you tax is total spending rather than total income however uh, i may say such a tax was proposed during world war ii in the treasury by the treasury department but was uh, that's a long story it never got anywhere as part of a wartime program and uh, at the time, the Treasury drew, drew up forms that could be used to enforce it and so on. Um, <clears throat> but less radical would be to have it on income, straight on income. And a flat tax on income with a l fairly large deduction exemption. Uh, one of the things that has happened over the last 50 years is that the value of the exemption has gone down drastically. It hasn't, it's been raised in dollar terms, but inflation is more than made up for that. And I believe it would be very healthy to have a larger, uh, a larger exemption, and particularly for children, uh, a family uh, allowance. Uh, I, I can't say anything, but more power to you. A flat tax would be a marvelous improvement over our present system with no deductions for anything except the most strictly defined occupational expenditures. That is, if you have to buy a nail to build a house, you can deduct the nail. But I would say no other deductions. Uh, and such a tax would in practice be more equitable than our present system, which is highly graduated on paper, but in, is in fact regressive in practice because high-income people can f figure out ways to get around it, and they don't. And most important, you know, I have my tax returns from 1934 to now, and it's fascinating to look at them. 1934, one piece of paper. 1939, two pieces of paper. And now I have to submit a tax. It's partly because I've gotten more income, but mostly because the tax system has gotten so complicated. However, on the tax system, you're never going to get what you want on that for a very simple reason. How are congressmen going to raise their campaign funds if they don't change the tax from time to time? How are they going to raise their campaign funds if they don't have uh, loopholes they can put in and take out from year to year? Surely, I think we would all agree that one of the things that could be done that would most improve the efficiency of the United States would be to have a flat rule Taxes cannot be changed more than once every five years. So people would know what to depend on. Now it's absurd. You have to figure every year there's a change coming. And so while I wish you well, I think this is a holy grail you're going after and you haven't got much chance of getting it. Well, that's exactly the kind of challenges we, we appreciate and we'd like to take them up. I want to thank you. I on the other hand, you know, if you get term limits, nice short-term limits, <laughs> Six-year six term limits. The problem of raising funds for, for re-election might not be so crucial, and then you might have a real chance of getting a flat tax. Okay. Again, let me thank the always <laughs> meddlesome <laughs> Professor Friedman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet with him. Comments about this meeting on the state of the economy should go to the House Republican Conference, 1618 Longworth Office Building, Washington, D.C., 
The zip code is 20515. Coming up next, the remarks of President Bill Clinton. On December 2nd, 1863, the last piece of the Statue of Freedom was placed atop the Capitol Dome. This Sunday, in preparation of the Capitol's 200th anniversary, the statue will be removed by helicopter for restoration. See this historic event in its entirety, live Sunday morning on C-SPAN, beginning at 6 a.m. Eastern Time. Next, remarks by President Bill Clinton. Yesterday, the President spoke at a meeting of export-import bank officials gathered here in Washington. Before delivering his prepared remarks on trade, the President commented on the situation in Bosnia and reacted to the Bosnian Serb Parliament decision to reject the United Nations peacekeeping plan. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Arkansas's best known export, <laughs> the President of the United States. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see all of you here in such large numbers. I want to thank my good friend Ken Brody for inviting me to come and speak with you for a few moments. You know, he's the president-designate of the XM Bank. That's a delicate way of saying that it takes a long time to get confirmed in today's Washington. I know a little about that in another context. <laughs> I have thought uh, a good deal about what I wanted to say to you today about the subject which brings you here. Uh, I hope you will understand if I ask for a few moments uh, to address the situation in Bosnia first, uh, not only because the national press is here, but because you were very much a part of the world which will be affected by what happens there and how that impacts uh, our friends and neighbors in Europe and particularly in the Mediterranean area. Over the past week, we saw some very encouraging progress toward a negotiated settlement of the tragic conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Two of the three Bosnian parties signed the Vance Owen Agreement. The third party, the Bosnian Serbs, signed contingent on approval by their self-styled parliament. Progress, unfortunately, was stopped by the Bosnian Serb Assembly's de facto rejection yesterday of the Vance Owen Agreement. Their action is a grave disappointment to all of us who seek an early and peaceful resolution to what has been a very brutal conflict. It abrogates the earlier approval of the peace plan by the Bosnian Serb leader, Karadzic. Their call for a referendum on the peace plan can only be seen as a delaying tactic to further consolidate the gains they have made because of the enormous advantage they have in heavy artillery coming as it does from the former Yugoslav army. It ignores the reality that everybody else in the world has recognized that sooner or later an enduring peace can only come from good faith negotiations that lead to a peace plan acceptable to all the parties. The international community I believe must not allow the Serbs to stall progress toward peace and continue brutal assaults on innocent civilians. We've seen too many things happen and we do have 
fundamental interests there, not only the United States, but particularly the United States as a member of the world community. The Serbs' actions over the past year violate the principle that internationally recognized borders must not be violated or altered by aggression from without. Their actions threaten to widen the conflict and foster instability in other parts of Europe in ways that could be exceedingly damaging. And their savage and cynical ethnic cleansing offends the world's conscience and our standards of behavior. Therefore, I have this morning directed Secretary Christopher to continue to pursue his consultations with our allies and friends in Europe and Russia on tougher measures which can be taken collectively, not by the United States alone, but collectively, to make clear to the Serbs that we are embarked on a course of peace and they are embarked on a costly course. The vote last night simply makes this Christopher mission more important. Secretary Christopher will be insistent that the time has come for the international community to unite and to act quickly and decisively. America has made its position clear and is ready to do its part, but Europe must be willing to act with us. We must go forward together. Your presence here, your understanding of the importance of exports to America's future, to the blending of our nation and our culture and our values with those of like-minded persons throughout the world, should only reinforce our determination to confine, in as much as the international community can possibly confine, savage act of inhumanity to people solely because of their ethnicity or their religion, and to confine insofar as we possibly can as an international community the ability of one country to invade another and upset its borders. And certainly to try to confine this centuries old series of ethnic and religious enmities to the narrowest possible geographical boundaries. That is what we seek, not to act alone, not to act rationally, not to do things which would draw the United States into a conflict not of its own making and not of its own ability to resolve, but simply concerted action that the international community can and should take to deal with these issues. I'll have more to say about it later, but in view of what happened today, I thought I ought to say this. For 59 years since President Franklin Roosevelt created it to help increase foreign aid and trade with the Soviet Union, the XM Bank has assisted United States companies sell to sell more than $270 billion in our exports all around the world. And now the bank's role in helping our economy and helping our exports has never been more important. You are the people who generate an enormous portion of our high-wage, high-growth jobs. Without expanding our exports, this country cannot grow, cannot grow economically, and cannot create more jobs. In the global economy, which we now are shaped by, we see a critical part of every economy's functioning is related to its level of productivity, especially in the export sector. We also know that America has some special problems entirely of our own making without regard to what we may or may not think of every aspect of our trade policy. We have relatively low savings and investment. We have an enormous budget deficit, which we ran up not in investing in productive investments at home that would produce later wealth, but largely in increasing consumption. Indeed, for the last five years, the spiraling growth of the government's deficit has been related almost entirely to paying more for the same health care and to bigger and bigger interest payments on accumulated debt. This is a terrible burden on the economic performance of this country as well as on our future. Finally, we have, as I said earlier, in pu putting more of our government's money to health care, we've also seen more private sector dollars go to health care, so that now we are spending 35 percent more of our national treasure on health care than any other nation in the world, imposing significant new burdens on American businesses as they seek to com compete within the American market and beyond the American market. We now, therefore, face an interesting set of challenges, particularly for a country used to looking for simple answers and dealing with one issue 
at a time. That is indeed one of the great debates in which I am engaged here. Some people say, well, you just ought to do one thing. Just reduce the deficit no matter what. For the last 12 years, we were on a track that, at least at election time, was focused on one thing, just lower taxes no matter what. Never mind what happens to the deficit, never mind what happens to the investment of the country, never mind what happens to the long-term economic health. Do we need to reduce the deficit? Yes, we do. Do we also need a targeted program of investment in the education and training of the American workforce and in the technologies that will shape this economy into the future? Yes, we do. Do we have anything so far to replace the steep, steep cuts in defense spending which have gone to the very heart of a lot of our high-wage, high-tech economy with many spinoffs benefiting the commercial economy? To date, no, we don't. But we need a technology policy and a defense conversion policy that attempts to replace that. So we need to bring down the deficit and we need a targeted program of investments in jobs, technology, and training. And thirdly, I would argue that we will never reduce the deficit to zero and never restore fundamental health to this economy until we address the health care crisis in terms of providing security to Americans and controlling the cost. And that is obviously a big part of what we're about up here. I do not believe we should be forced into the for false choice of saying we must do one or the other. In the past, our governments have come to people saying, well, we'll just spend money and solve your problems for you. Or we'll just cut taxes and solve your problems for you. Today, we have to have a much more disciplined and coherent approach that says we are going to bring the deficit down, we are going to target investments in technology and training, and we are going to do something about the health care crisis. But we must have an economic policy that is more than investments, that involves doing the right things with technology policy, the right things with defense conversion, the right things with the XM Bank, the right things to expand our commitment to exports. Indeed, the economy, I think, must continue to be the number one priority of our country, and therefore the number one priority of this administration. The work that exporters and the XM Bank do to expand jobs and growth is fundamentally important. Because every time we sell a billion dollars of American products and services overseas, we create about 20,000 jobs. And all more than 7 million Americans clearly owe their jobs to exports. And because those workers in export-related jobs make about 17 percent more than the average worker, we need more of those jobs. I have this chart here I wanted to show. It's the only one I brought today. I'm trying to resist my policy wonk impulses. <laughs> but I do want to, you can't see it over there. It shows that in all industries, export-related jobs have average hourly wages of 11.69 as compared with $10.02 for non-export-related jobs. In manufacturing, the figures are virtually the same, 11.93 to 10.83. And in services, the margin is even bigger. 1130 to 983. It is clear, therefore, that one of the answers to the wage stagnation which has gripped the American economy for almost 20 years now, with most hourly wage workers in the country working longer work weeks for stagnant or lower wages, one of the answers to that is to increase our exports. In the last five years, exports have accounted for almost half of our nation's economic growth. Goods and services exports made up 10.7 percent of our GDP in 1992, up dramatically from only 7.5 percent in 1985, just seven years earlier. Your work is important because if U.S. technology, whether it's related to the environment, energy, transportation, or telecommunications, is to secure its preeminence, it must have a global reach. Only with world markets can we afford the research and development to stay competitive. Export expansion obviously encourages our most advanced industries. I am committed to promoting these exports. And that's where the XM Bank plays an important role. In fiscal year 1992, the XM Bank fostered more than a quarter million American jobs that were an outgrowth of the bank's support for $14 billion in exports. That's pretty impressive, but it won't be enough just to hold our own ground. I know we can top that by strengthening the partnership 
between our government and the private sector through the XM Bank. It's helped to send abroad everything from machine tools to computer software. It's been at the forefront of the new export industry that our Vice President has championed, the environmental industry. One that is so important that I have directed Commerce Secretary Ron Brown to work with the XM Bank, the EPA, and the Department of Energy to craft a national strategy for environmental exports. These efforts will not only help to clean up the planet, they'll put a lot more Americans to work. We have several environmental services exporters with us here today. One of them, Harza Engineering of Chicago, helped a rural community in Venezuela to fight off the threat of cholera and other diseases by channeling a fresh water supply. At the same time, it created more than 1,000 jobs for Americans. That's just one case among many. We want to increase exponentially these successes in all areas of exports. We can also make ourselves more competitive by streamlining our programs, an action long overdue. Right now, there are more than 150 different export promotion programs in more than 10 agencies. They're tangled like a ball of yarn, and our goal is to untangle them. We want to end the duplication and overlap to make sure all these programs are customer-driven. We want our guide to be the needs of the exporters and the lenders. Our vehicle to a coherent export promotion plan will be the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee, an interagency group created by the Congress largely through the efforts of Senator Don Regal. The Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown, chairs the group, which has been meeting daily, and once he is confirmed, Ken will also have hands-on involvement in that effort. With the Department of Commerce, and the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee, XM will help lead the way toward developing an export mentality throughout our government and throughout our nation. At the same time, the bank will become more of an active, consumer-friendly bank, one that will get more attention, give more attention, to small and medium-sized businesses. For every applicant, the bank will aim to bypass unnecessary red tape. Right now, it takes the staff about six months to process a preliminary commitment application. And only one in six such preliminary commitment leads to an actual, actual export sale. But with new procedures, the bank will be able to respond to most requests within seven days. Now that's reinventing government. The staff will be able to process more cases and support more real deals. In short, the XM Bank will use better management measures to do more without spending more. In these days of deficit reduction, the bank will have to live within its means like all other government agencies. But Ken has assured me that he has a number of ways to make your tax dollars work harder and more effectively. What we do domestically and how we do internationally are inseparable. As I said earlier in my remarks, as the XM Bank builds export markets abroad, we have to do more to assure that our workers are equipped with the skills that they need. The average worker will now change jobs eight times in a lifetime. We have to do a better job of their education and training. We need to become better students of economics. The old ways of doing business simply don't translate into reality today. One of the first things I did when I became president was to establish a national economic council. It just made good sense to me. We had a national security council it met with the president on a regular basis to deal with security issues, but a great deal of our security is in the economic area. And there was no regular discipline mechanism by which all the economic decisions were considered in terms of their impact on one another, and the United States could develop a coherent policy. Today, we have that mechanism, and it works. It works well, and we're working hard to make it work better. One of the reasons I was so gratified to get congressional approval of the overall budget plan that I presented in record time. It was the first time in 17 years that Congress had passed a budget resolution within the legal mandate, which reduces the deficit by over $500 billion through spending cuts and tax increases, and there will be not one without the other. I can tell you that. I'm not about to raise your taxes unless the spending cuts are there first. There will be no budget without both. This is very important in the export area. I can't tell you how many years, you probably know this as well as I do, how many of the years the United States would show up at some meeting of the G7 or another international meeting 
and all of our trading partners would spend all their time telling us that we ought to get our financial house in order. We ought to bring our deficit down. We ought to do something to clean up our own backyard before we lectured our trading partners about changes in policy. But now we're in a different position. When I go to the G7 meeting in July in Tokyo, the United States will be a success story in the making. For starters, we have a responsible budget plan that does reduce the deficit. Our interest rates as a result have fallen in many areas to historic lows, allowing American homeowners and businesses to refinance with ways that if we can keep these rates down for a year, virtually all economists concede will put $100 billion plus back into this economy simply because of lower interest rates. In this room today, I bet there are scores of people who have refinanced their home mortgages or been able to have lower business loans as a result of these interest rates. This is the ultimate stimulus for the American economy if we can pass the budget that reduces the deficit and keep these rates down. It is very, very important. When we can point to these accomplishments, it makes it much easier for us to work with the Japanese and getting them to stimulate their economy and buy more exports. It makes it much easier for us to argue to our friends in Germany that it's a good thing to keep bringing interest rates down. It makes it easier to try to help work together with a coordinated economic policy to lift the world out of the economic stagnation that we now see in Europe and the Pacific as well as in North America. These things are very, very important. But there is more that we have to do. After seven years of talks, I would very much like to see a successful completion of the Uruguay round of the GATT by December the 15th. World economic prosperity depends on it. It's the foundation of the global trading system. A few days ago, I met with the finance ministers and the central bankers of the G7 nations, and I told them that the United States was prepared to make extraordinary efforts to complete the Uruguay round successfully, that we were willing to go the extra mile in doing that, but we needed their help and support, and I hope we will get it. The GATT agreement would be a blessing for the United States exporters because it will lower foreign tariffs, curb subsidies that tilt the playing field, and strengthen the protection of intellectual property, the piracy of which costs our companies about $60 billion a year. In the GATT and in all of our trade talks, we have put our trading partners on notice that I expect access to their markets comparable to the access we want to extend to them. But we welcome foreign products and services and investments here as long as our products, services, and investments have a chance to be welcomed in other countries as well. It's fair and it's good business. These are the principles that will underscore not only our multilateral, but our bilateral relationships as well. With the right markets at home and the right rules in international markets, our export opportunities are virtually limitless. I want to say a special word about our opportunities in our own backyard in Latin America. Latin America is reigning in its debt, and what is emerging from a more stable economy is a populace clamoring for consumer products and entrepreneurs who are shopping for capital goods. It's a market for our exports that is growing at three times the rate of any other market in the world. That is why I strongly support the North American Free Trade Agreement with the supplemental agreements we are presently negotiating with Canada and Mexico relating to labor and the environment. NAFTA will help us to unlock a market that will create hundreds of thousands of high-paying jobs. And NAFTA, therefore, is a high priority for this administration. The reason it is so controversial is that the American people have seen 12 years in which their wages have gone down and three years in which we actually have fewer private sector jobs. And everybody is afraid of change. But the only way a rich country can grow richer is by exporting more and by having more partners in economic progress. And if we can make this agreement with Mexico work, then we can move forward to the other market economies of Latin America, to Chile, to Argentina, to any number of other nations who want to be a part of this kind of partnership. I think it is very, very important. Just listen to this. Exports to Canada already support a million and a half American jobs. 
And in the past five years, the number of American jobs tied to Mexico have grown from 300,000 to 700,000 jobs, almost exclusively because of the unilateral reduction of trade restrictions by Mexico, which have allowed the volume of trade two-way to go up and the trade deficit to be erased. These are very encouraging signs. We project another 200,000 good jobs if we can have a successful implementation of the NAFTA process. Mexico is a valued customer for another reason. We also believe that this new economic thinking, if it works, will help to spread all across the developing world. We know that there are an impressive array of political and economic leaders in Mexico, and I know that the Secretary of Finance, Pedro Aspe, is with us today. I want to welcome him and extend my best wishes to President Salinas for our emerging partnership. Outside this hemisphere, I think we have to look increasingly to the newly industrializing countries of Asia. I know we have someone here from Indonesia. Indonesia is the fifth biggest country in the world. Indonesia is now the leader of the non-aligned nations. They have a resolution on Bosnia actually being debated in the United Nations today. Maybe they can figure out how to do a better job with this. We have enormous opportunities there. When I go to the G7 meeting in Japan, I'm going to meet with the president of Indonesia to send a signal to the non-aligned nations, to the emerging nations of the world, that the United States wants to be their partner in new trade relations, that there are all kinds of things that we can continue to do that we have not done before. Finally, let me say just a little word about Russia. The bank is now setting out to do what it was originally set up to do because Russia may be able to absorb its efforts. To date, the bank has approved $205 million in final commitments to Russia. It's working on an oil and gas agreement framework that could support as much as $2 billion in American goods and services for Russia's energy sector. As I told President Yeltsin when we met in Vancouver, uh, the United States once had a famous citizen named Willie Sutton who was asked why he was devoting his entire life to robbing banks, and he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> and uh, in Russia, energy is where the money is. If we can work it out, we can make a huge partnership there in ways that are enormously beneficial for the American economy and good for the Russians as well. At different junctures in this century, our country has shown itself to be a catalyst for global reform. We have faced off fascism and communism. We helped to build the international institutions after World War II that made so many good things happen in the non-communist world and now because of the collapse of communism are coming into their own with the real potential to fully flower. The world of tomorrow will reward those of us who not only have the values which made these institutions possible but which behave in ways that will be rewarded in the hard glare of international economic competition. I just saw today another set of figures showing that in the first quarter of this year there was another huge increase in productivity in the American manufacturing sector. We want those manufacturers who are increasing their productivity. We want their workers who are the source of that increased productivity to be rewarded. I am convinced that the only way we can do it is by opening markets to the United States and giving the American people the chance to enjoy the benefits of the fruits of their labor and giving other countries the chance to grow through mutual trade and development. You are on the front lines of that. I came here to salute you and to assure you that through the XM Bank and every other means at this administration's command, we will do our best to have the kind of trade policy that will grow the American economy and benefit the entire world. Thank you very much.
Send your comments about the speech to the White House. The address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20500. Coming next, we break for some schedule information. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network and its companion network C-SPAN 2 are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable television companies. Here's a brief look at this morning's program schedule and please note that all listed times given here are Eastern times only. Coming next, coverage of last night's salute to Helen Thomas of United Press International. It was given by the American News Women's Club. Ms. Thomas has been covering the White House for half a century. That's followed by our daily presentation of the evening newscast from Russian National Television. The Journalist Roundtable will begin this morning at 8 o'clock. Three Washington-based correspondents will be joining us in our studios to discuss and take your calls on the top news stories of the week. And at 9.30 this morning, we will take you up to Capitol Hill for live C-SPAN coverage of a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing looking at the issue of gays and lesbians serving in the military. That's the C-SPAN program schedule at this hour. Our next update will be along just before 8 o'clock this morning. Friday, Senator Sam Nunn, Democrat from Georgia, will chair a meeting of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Members will convene to examine the ban on gays and lesbians in the military. Live coverage begins on C-SPAN, Friday morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming next, we take you to the Four Seasons Hotel in Washington for coverage of last night's salute to reporter Helen Thomas of United Press International. Ms. Thomas has been covering the presidency for 50 years and is the dean of the White House Press Corps. The salute is sponsored by the American News Women's Club and features the remarks of Andrea Mitchell of NBC News, White House Press Secretary Dee Dee Myers, and Carter Administration Press Secretary Jody Powell, and ABC News correspondent Sam Donaldson, among others. We now take you to the Four Seasons Hotel in Washington for coverage of last night's salute. of Helen's Just Desserts. So we're going to have just two of the roasters perform first, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to Andrea Mitchell. Of course, we're gonna to have to give a few ribs to Andrea. We can't give her all claps. Of course, she is the NBC White House correspondent. And if President Clinton thought he was going to have some trouble when he had to look at the front row during press conferences at Helen, he then also had to look at those demure power suits that Andrea wore and realized that she was going to ask a question that he could not get out of. It made, no matter what he answered, it made headlines. <laughs> she covered the Clinton campaign, and then NBC had her move from Capitol Hill back to the White House as the chief White House correspondent. She is also a pundit on the Today Show, a frequent griller on Meet the Press. I will tell you that Andrea and I worked together at WTOP-TV in this town. I was there about a, six months to a year before Andrea, and everyone in the newsroom said, aha, two tough reporter broads, what a cat fight we're gonna have now. Of course, Andrea and I were students of history, and we were knew that they were not going to divide and conquer. Andrea and I became fast friends, and I'm pleased to this day to say she's one of my closest friends. 
She is a person who is a woman's woman. And because you don't get to see that other side of her behind those tough questions, you must know a few of the things about her. She is a board member of the National Chamber Orchestra. She played a mean violin in our pre-reporter days. She isn't selling cookies yet, but she is also an active member of the advisory board of the Girl Scouts of America of Washington, D.C., and if you'd like to, she can arrange to get some delivered to your home. <laughs> Andrea Mitchell, will you give some words about Helen Thomas? Thank you, Susan. I'm really delighted to be here tonight to honor Helen Thomas, who is the Dean of our Press Corps. As you all know, Helen is more than an institution. She's a legend. For generations, Helen has been breaking in new presidents and their press secretaries. <laughs> and it's really been fascinating to watch, to watch her paper train this new young crowd. Some people might have thought about resting on their laurels, but not Helen. Helen really wanted to cover the new leader of the free world and her husband, Bill. <laughs> now, one thing we've all noticed about Bill Clinton since he came into office, those of us who covered him during the campaign and the transition have really been uh, amazed at how he's improved his jogging speed since he was sworn in. And he has really uh, picked up his pace. It's amazing how you can do that when you're running away from Helen. Because <laughs> Helen still hasn't gotten a story out of those morning runs with Bill Clinton, but at least she's now doing a five-minute mile. <laughs> As we all know, Helen has been terrorizing presidents for a very long time. She covered Kennedy and Nixon and Johnson and John Quincy Adams. <laughs> As Jody and Dee Dee know, you can count on Helen to ask the toughest questions every day. For instance, it was Helen who asked Thomas Jefferson, is there any truth to that rumor about you and Sally Hemings? <laughs> <laughs> 